Hey everybody, what's going on? Walt here for Overkill Projects and today we are going to finally finish off this SMD reflow oven project that I've sort of been, you know, dragging along with a bunch of tutorials and stuff like that forever. So over the last few months, I have really belabored the point and done a million tutorials on the things that you need to put something like this together. Uh, that includes, you know, how to use this little uh, STM32, you know, Arduino Nano compatible board that you see on there. Uh, it's a, called Nucleo32. And how to use SPI to communicate with uh, thermocouple ICs, which you can see mounted on the controller there. Uh, you know, how thermocouples work. Uh, pretty much everything that you would need to know to build something like this uh, for your own lab. And so really this video is just going to be about if you were going to do this yourself, you know, what does the assembly look like and uh, maybe what are some of the pitfalls? What are some of the things I would do differently if I could do it again? But I think that everything turned out pretty darn well. There are only a few things that I would do differently uh, and we'll get to those. The inside of this toaster is really straightforward. Uh, this is just a little $10 Facebook marketplace pickup, but it's not one of those fancy newfangled toaster ovens with the electronic controller and all that sort of good stuff. This just has like a normal thermostat and just a simple little resistive device to set the, uh, the temperature and uh, a timer, which is effectively just an on and off switch really. But one of the features that it does have uh, that I really liked, the reason that I picked up this one instead of one of the other, you know, 2000 toasters on Facebook Marketplace uh, is that this is a convection oven. So it has a little built-in AC fan. But besides that, it's not really worth going over all of the wiring uh, in this toaster oven because it's it's pretty boring. But what you should know is what the finished wiring diagram for this project is going to look like. And you can see that what I'm really doing here is I'm removing the control elements uh, from the front of the toaster oven and I'm replacing them with a big honking uh, solid state relay and an electronic controller, which is our Nucleo board. Now, of course, if you've been paying attention, then you know that that controller is going to use as input uh, the data from a couple of thermocouple ICs. There's two thermocouples that I have inside the toaster oven itself. Uh, I, I chose to use two because I'm pretty sure that there's a wide temperature difference between the front and the back of this toaster oven. Uh, when I ran it with nothing in it before I started this project, it was pretty clear that the, the heating elements towards the rear of the unit heat significantly hotter than the front heating elements. So, you know, I wanted to make sure that the controller could kind of take that into account. And now to execute this wiring diagram, I actually kept most of the native crimp connectors that they had on the wires inside the toaster oven to begin with. Now I did this because they are using open barrel crimps and, you know, they use a, a machine that does that very effectively. And now I want these open barrel crimp connectors because they are typically more secure than than, you know, a standard crimp connector. And I'm looking for that security because everything in this toaster oven, all the wiring that I have over there is at mains voltage. I want everything as secure as possible. I don't want there to be any possibility that a loose crimp can electrocute the hell out of me one day. Now, actually along those lines, this toaster is most unfortunately just, you know, a simple two wire polarized plug. Uh, there is a spot to have a, a ground wire to the chassis, but there's no ground wire in this, so you know, we can't have that. It's shocking that there is such a toaster oven out there right now, because honestly, if one of those crimp connectors had come off of one of these knobs on the front of the toaster and had made contact with the chassis on the side or really anywhere, this would have been a serious electrocution hazard. But now in our rewire, I alleviate a lot of those problems. And I do that by, again, using new open barrel crimp connectors for the, the rewired parts. But then after I sort of have everything together, I wrapped everything in high temperature, make sure it's high temperature, high temperature electrical tape. Now high temperature electrical tape comes in, you know, a few different uh, styles, but I specifically used uh, type 69 adhesive, uh, you know, glass 
high temperature electrical tape. This is one of those things that I, I thought I had laying around the lab somewhere and I didn't. I had to order it, you know, it took a few days to get in. But this kind in particular is really nice for this type of application. Uh, it doesn't mind the high temperatures. In fact, after it gets hot a few times, the adhesive actually sort of solidifies into, I don't want to say like an epoxy, but you know, it gets more solid and more rigid and it, it decreases the likelihood that it's going to slip or that, you know, the, that the crimp connectors would come apart. And I should actually also mention that the crimp connectors I have also have locks so that, you know, once everything is secure, I can make sure that those pieces are locked together and they're not going to come un, uh, unconnected at some point. And since we're talking about that high temperature stuff, you know, you have to make sure that you use high temperature friendly parts for pretty much everything in this design. You can't just go rewiring this with normal wire because the, the coating on that wire is likely to start to get soft. Uh, it might move over time. And next thing you know, you've got some bare wires that are sitting there at 120 volts or 240 volts, depending on what country you're in, you know, and, and you could really do yourself a lot of damage. But once I have the inside wired up, you know, we're pretty much good to go. We just have to mount the controller, the switch, and also something for us to get five volts from, you know, to the outside of this toaster oven. So for the controller, like I said, we've already been over that. Uh, you know, this is the same controller I had from before. Uh, last time uh, I had a video, I don't know if it was the last video, but maybe a couple of videos ago, I had one about thermocouples and thermocouple ICs, you know, and I communicated with those and then read the temperature out to a screen. That's the foundation for this controller is, you know, we read the, uh, the thermocouple temperatures and then we send that data back into the controller. We take a look and we ask, well, okay, so, do we have to turn the heating elements on or is it getting too hot and we should turn them off? And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that controller design in a minute. But then when I want to actually turn the heating elements on, the way I accomplish that is I am going to send an on signal to a solid state relay that I mount to the outside of the toaster oven. Now these solid state relays, you can pick them up kind of cheap on, on eBay. There's a company that you can find pretty readily on eBay that, you know, seems to be a common source for these things. Although I found a, a legitimate, uh, Crydom SSR on eBay for a really good price. In fact, I found a bunch of them for pretty good prices, uh, good enough prices that I bought a handful. And specifically, this is a D2450 switch, uh, which is a 50 amp, uh, 120 volt switch. So because this has a 50 amp maximum, it's really unlikely that I'm going to run up against any sort of problems with heating or anything like that. Uh, but even though I know that there shouldn't be any thermal issues, I still have it mounted to a big monster heat sink and I used the appropriate thermal paste. You know, you can see here, I applied thermal paste the right way and that should keep it nice and cool, even though I really don't anticipate that this is going to gain more than a couple of degrees uh, over the ambient temperature. The only other issue that we had to address with this was some way to get five volts to the Nucleo board. Uh, and the easiest way to do that is via the USB port on the Nucleo board itself. I think like most people, I have a few dozen five volt uh, phone chargers with micro USB uh, plugs on them. So I just mounted a little polarized outlet on the side of the toaster oven. Uh, it's one of those little $2 jobbies you can pick up at any home supply store like Home Depot, Lowe's, one of those things. I just have the power running directly from the cord uh, through that outlet before it goes into the wiring for the main part of the toaster. And so I can just plug in my five volt power supply there and then, you know, plug in the controller. I should be good to go. And now one of the other pitfalls that I ran into is that I should have measured twice and cut once or drilled once when it came to drilling the holes into the uh, the side of this toaster oven. I did not. I thought I could just sort of wing it. And as a result, I pretty much have Swiss cheese as the side of this toaster oven. And it also took me, I don't know, like four different trips out to the garage to, uh, to drill all the holes that I ended up needing uh, in the places that I needed them in order to wire this thing up. So if you do a similar project, make sure you really, you know, have thought out the locations of where you want all the, the wiring to go so that you can save yourself a lot of time and frustration and just drill once and be done with it. I didn't want to cut through the insulation. Uh, it's actually easier to cut than you would think. And so, you know, uh, the, the aluminum that this thing is made out of uh, it does a pretty good job of chewing right through that insulation. So you can see here, I, uh, I used regular electrical tape on this outside cover uh, to sort of cover the, 
the area around the lip of the hole so that it wouldn't damage the the, uh, the cables. Uh, it was a little more difficult for the thermocouples themselves, even though they do have e better insulation still. But I ended up going with a design where I sort of have the wires pinned uh, against a couple of washers. Uh, they sort of like go through the middle of a couple of washers and then I have a bolt that's really too small for those washers, but the thermocouples sort of take up the rest of the room so that it, it fills it out. But it seems to work out really well and you can see, I think, here on the inside, you know, we have the, the one in the front here and the one in the back. And I think that that will work just fine. So now onto the actual controller. Really the design is pretty straightforward. It's what you would call a PID controller, but only for a small section of the controller itself. If you are familiar with SATA reflow profiles, uh, and if you're not, I'm gonna link in down below a couple of like little data sheet um, or application notes. You typically have a pretty steep linear rise up until your preheat stage, and then you're gonna have a relatively low rise throughout the preheat up until you get to the point where you're gonna ramp the temperature really high uh, and drive the solder into its liquid stage. But now unless you find yourself an extremely powerful toaster oven, or a very, I don't know, very short or very narrow toaster oven, it's probably not going to have enough power to drive the, uh, the initial ramping up to the preheat. And even when you do the ramping after your preheat stage into your final flow stage, uh, it's probably not gonna have quite enough power to do it the way a professional SMD oven would work. But what it really means is that during the phases where we want a very steep ramp upwards in temperature, we're just going to leave the, the switch on. And so we don't really need to control those sections so much as we need to know, you know when we are at the different stages. And so the only stage that we really need to control is the preheat stage. When we're in the preheat stage, we're pretty much in a holding pattern where we want the temperature to change a little bit. You know, we want it to rise at a slow and steady pace from say 125 or 150 degrees right up until the liquefaction temperature for solder, uh, you know, depending on what kind of solder you're using, which for leaded solder is 183 degrees Celsius. Now, if you don't know anything Thing about PID controllers, uh, they're extremely common uh, for applications like this. Now the idea of feedback and feedback control should be pretty clear to you. Every time you drive your car, you are producing a feedback loop where your control of the car depends on the external stimulus that's coming into you, into your eyes, your ears, or you know, whatever. And then you take that information, you process it, you know, you sort of calculate the, the risks or you know you calculate what you should be doing and then the output is like what you do with the pedals or what you do with the steering wheel or the shift and then the results of those actions are then you know fed back into the loop you see what happened you sped up a little and now you see the result and you adjust again and that continuous adjustment process is a feedback loop in a PID controller, in the feedback portion, uh, in this case, the measuring of the temperature inside the oven chamber by the thermocouples, we're going to take that data and then we're gonna take a look at three different aspects of that data relative to what we want to see. So like I said, once we hit 125 degrees Celsius, we know that we want a very slow, roughly linear ascent from 125 degrees up to 180, 183 degrees. And so if you know how long we want that to take, we know at any given time what the temperature in the oven should be. So if this is our theoretical value, then every measurement we take from the thermocouple is our actual value, and we can subtract one from the other to come up with an error term. And now once we have that error error term, what we do with it is what makes this thing a PID controller. And so we're going to look at the error in three different ways. The first way is just the error itself. You know, we measured this error and now we might multiply that by some coefficient, 
but that just gives us a proportional value of the error. And that's where the P comes from. It's the proportional measurement of our uh, input of our error. And a version of this controller where we only use that proportional error is sort of like the simplest thing you could probably come up with, you know, where if the temperature in the chamber is too high, then we turn the switch off. If the temperature is too low, then we turn the heating elements on, you know, by turning the switch on. And that's all well and good. And in fact, in this application, it might work just fine. But there are two other things we're going to look at. One of them is the integral of the error from the initial time that you know we started, from the time that we hit 125 degrees Celsius, up until the time that we're taking our measurement. And now if you haven't had any calculus, uh, you might not know that an integral is just a sum. So what we're really saying for this term is that we're going to take all the error that's happened so far and add it together. Now sometimes that error is going to be a positive value, sometimes it's going to be a negative value, you know, depending on whether the measurement in the oven was high or low. You might be able to get a feel for why we would want this term if you think about it, you know, for a second. If the temperature in the oven has been consistently high higher than what we wanted, you know, higher than our theoretical value. And so we would want the sum of all those positive errors to add some weight to our decision making on what we should do with the switch. If it's been too high for too long, then maybe we want to keep that switch off for a while longer so that those parts can kind of cool back down to the range we want them in. And then the last way we're going to look at the error is we're going to take a look at the derivative of the error. And again, if you've had no calculus, that's fine. Derivatives aren't really that scary. They just tell you how much change a function is going through at any given time. So the derivative of the error tells us how much error we've gained between the last measurement and this measurement. What's the slope of the line between those two measurements? If the derivative is very high, then that means that the temperature between the last measurement and the current measurement has gone up significantly. You know, there's been a very steep slope, a steep increase between those two temperatures. And so maybe we want to make sure that the heating elements turn off because it's as though, you know, they're heating too quickly. It's not necessarily that the heat itself is too much. It's that we might shock the components by heating them too quickly. And so now a PID controller takes those three uh, considerations of the error term, you know, the proportional, the integral and the derivative. And then it takes a weight for each one of those. So, you know, you have some proportion of the P, some proportion of the I, some proportion of the D, and those are called the coefficients for each of those terms. And then you add all of that up and it's going to give you a value. And now in our case, it's going to give a value and I'm going to say, okay, if that value is positive, then I want you to turn the heating elements off. If it's negative, I want you to turn the heating elements on. Actually, it might be backwards, but I've forgotten. And if you think PID controllers sound really neat, uh, I highly recommend you take a peek at them. Uh, they are a small uh, piece of a much huger field called control theory, uh, which I find really interesting. It has a very intense math component uh, once you get far enough along. Okay. So I think that's finally everything. I feel like I've gone on forever and ever. So let's actually fire this thing up. And remember that after you've run this thing even once, uh, there's no reason to ever put food in it again. Uh, the chemicals that are gonna come out of this reflow process are pretty noxious. There is no point in risking it. So don't go sticking a bagel in here after you do a, a PCB. That's just, it's stupid. Don't do that. All right, so there you go. Uh, it works, but not optimally, right? So the, something you should have seen there is that while everything sort of goes with the flow properly, uh, I'm definitely in the high zone a little bit too long. So that's something that uh, I need to fix here. But otherwise it looks pretty good, aside from the fact that there's like a 20 degrees Celsius difference between the front and the back of the oven. 
Uh, I don't love that, but it's kind of what we have to deal with. So I'm not gonna bother doing like a full PCB test uh, for this video since, you know, it's already kind of too long, uh, but maybe I'll do a separate video where I do a test of boards and like the front, middle and back. Uh, we kind of get the results of what they look like. I'll make some adjustments to the controller to make sure that everything, you know, shakes out and works the right way. And we'll go forward from there. And this will be our SMD reflow oven moving forward. I hope you had fun because I know I did. Uh, if you did, make sure you hit the thumbs up down below, subscribe, comment down below, check the description for you know links to information and all that good stuff. And I will see you next time. Thanks for joining me.